Hi, and welcome everyone. We're gonna give it a few minutes here just to allow some people to, to join us, but happy you're joining us today. In the meantime, it's nice and cool here in the southwest corner of Oregon. We actually had some rain this morning, only for a few minutes, but that was pretty nice. And welcome you to uh, let me know in the chat how the weather is in your area while we're waiting for any others to join. Ah, lush and rainy where Tangi is at. That's sounds nice. We've been having some really hot days. We hit over a hundred yesterday, so the rain this morning was nice and cool. Hot in Northwest Montana, smoky. Oh, I hear you, Lisa. We finally had the smoke clear out here. Oh, and warm in Albuquerque. All right, well, um, go ahead and get started. I see some people might still be joining, but I just want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's career prep discussion session. Uh, we're going to be looking today at trending top river topics to focus your studies on. So in today's session, uh, we're going to have a panel of river professionals introduce some trending river topics from science and policy to field work and management. We're gonna have some breakout room discussions. We're gonna have the opportunity, you'll have the opportunity to leverage these conversations to hopefully shape your educational path and better set yourself up for an in-demand river career. But first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Angie Furman and I am the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. I'm gonna be helping moderate today's session along with Tanji Akasi Otu from the U.S. Forest Service. Tanji, if you want to say hi and introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Tanji, and as Angie mentioned, I work for the Forest Service um, with the Washington office staff. So I live in Falls Church, Virginia, and come to D.C. to work in the office every now and then. Um, I came to the Forest Service through um, a program for recent grads and students called the Resource Assistance Program recently. So we're just always looking forward to opportunities to engage more students and give them opportunities to pursue careers um, in river management. And yeah, we're looking forward to hearing from you today. Thanks, Angie. So this is the first of four sessions in our career prep discussion series that's created through a partnership between RMS and the Forest Service. And so this month, as I mentioned, we're looking at some trending topics that you can potentially focus your studies on. In October, we're going to be looking at some different river careers and what does the day-to-day -day life really look like? You know, for example, how much time is in the office versus in the field. What does the commute look like? Where do they even work from? So um, we'll explore all sorts of different topics uh, related to the day-to-day -day life. And then at the beginning of November, we're gonna take a look at some entry-level opportunities that can help you jumpstart your river career. Uh, and then at the end of November, we're gonna host a discussion with hiring managers on how to get your foot in the door and how to, how to stand out to them. So we hope you join us for the rest of these discussions in this series. As far as today, um, just a few reminders. There is closed captioning that you can turn on or off uh, just by clicking the CC button on your Zoom toolbar. And also we are recording today's session. We're gonna email this out to all of you as a follow-up in case uh, you wanna see what went on in the other breakout room or you just wanna come back and check out the discussion. And we're also going to post this on the RMS video channel, where you can also check out a lot of other great videos. Also, we really encourage you to participate today and ask questions. If you want to ask questions, there's a couple ways you can do it. We've got a smaller group, so you can um, raise your hand, which you can find in the, the Zoom features by clicking on the control panel or the chat panel. You can also ask your question by typing it into the chat, and we'll read it out loud. And just one more um, item is just, here's a quick look at what we're gonna hope to accomplish today during our session. 
in a minute here, we're going to have our panelists introduce themselves. And then we're going to go into a couple breakout sessions, just where we can have some smaller um, conversations. And then we're going to come back and do a short Jamboard reflection activity, and then have a quick discussion about the River Management Symposium coming up next February. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'd like to invite today's panelists to introduce themselves. And I'll just go ahead and, and call on each of you. Why don't we go ahead and start with Coulter? Hi there. My name is Coulter Pence. I work for the Flathead National Forest in Northwest Montana. Here I am a Wilderness, Wild and Scenic Rivers and Trails Program Manager. Um, and then I'm hoping to share with you today things that are I could use more help with or things I see on the horizon in the work that I do. Thanks, Coulter. How about Danielle? You are muted, Danielle. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Danielle Perry. I'm a water resource geographer, and I'm the director of the Free Flowing Rivers Lab at Northern Arizona University in the School of Earth and Sustainability. I'm also the co-chair of the International Durable River Protection Coalition, um, the science lead on the Wild and Scenic Rivers Coalition leadership team, and the chair of the Sacred Waters and Indigenous subgroup of the IUCN. Um, wild uh, freshwater specialty group. So the research that we do in my lab here uh, revolves around any of those topics uh, that I just mentioned. Thanks, Danielle. How about Kelly? Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Kareem, and I'm a research ecologist at the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute. And we are a small research group um, of scientists that are based in the Forest Service, but we perform research to inform stewardship um, of wilderness for all agencies that manage wilderness areas. So that includes Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Park Service, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, did I get them all? I think I did. Um, so yeah, and my background is in aquatic ecology and genetics. And so I um, am sort of taking this a lens or approach of thinking about how we can inform stewardship of wilderness and understand the benefits of wilderness to broader landscapes from the um, standpoint of aquatic ecology, fish diversity, um, species distributions, those types of questions. Thanks, Kelly. How about next, let's do Lisa. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Ronald and I have uh, a couple different roles um, similar to Danielle. So I'm the Western Montana Associate Conservation Director with American Rivers. That's a newer position from me. And I'm focusing largely there on um, everything from wild and scenic um, designation and eligibility to um, urban water issues uh, in Western Montana, so very local conservation. I also lead the Wild and Scenic Rivers Coalition, which is a national alliance of more than 60 river protection groups across the country, and so have a finger to some degree on some of the preeminent wild and scenic issues in the country that are, that are coming up. So I'll be talking to you today more about, I think, um, how climate and equity are intersecting in some of the work that I'm doing locally in, in Western Montana. Thanks, Lisa. And Tony? Hi, everybody. My name is Tony Mancuso. I am the program manager for the Green and Colorado's Colorado Rivers at the state of Utah Department of Natural Resources. Um, my background comes through geography and working as a backcountry ranger. I now supervise um, land use authorizations, public land management, uh, river management, and supervising river rangers throughout the Green and Colorado River in Utah. Thanks, Tony. And James? I'm James Major. I'm the National Rivers Project Coordinator here for RMS. Um, I'm a non-traditional student, uh, so I didn't start uh, my schooling this path of rivers until in my 30s. Before that, I was working in restaurants and bars, um, but went to college, ended up in Oregon, 
then went and did grad school in Arizona at NAU, and then landed a position here a couple of years ago at RMS. So um, I have my ex experience is uh, as a student most recently, and then as a professional for RMS. Thanks, James. And, you know, we'd love to know a little bit about you all joining us. Um, now that you've gotten to hear from some of our panelists and just here, if you'd like to share uh, by unmuting, you can go ahead and raise your hand and then we can call on you. But we'd just like to know like what field of interest you're, or field of study you're interested in or career interests. You can also share that with us in the chat um, if that works better for you. I'll give it a few seconds here for people to type or. All right. I do see a hand up from Peyton. Yeah, Peyton, go ahead and unmute. Uh, hi, I'm Peyton. I'm a VCU student in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm studying environmental studies. And I'm minoring in biology. And I think I'm interested in ecology. I've really enjoyed my ecology classes. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing, Peyton. And I think there's definitely some conversations that will intersect with ecology and, and those interests today. Anyone else care to share? How about Max? Hi everyone, my name is Max Morange and uh, I live in Bellingham, Washington. Um, maybe a little bit like James, I'm a little bit less of a traditional um, path in, in this regard. Uh, I'm exploring the idea of a transition of a career, um, having worked in nonprofit service and um, food systems work for the last 20 years or so. Um, exploring the idea of transitioning into natural resource management and really excited about the opportunity to participate in the call today. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Yeah, Mitchell, go ahead. Hi, I'm Mitchell Lang. Um, I am a third year undergraduate student at the University of Virginia studying environmental sciences um, with a um, environmental and biological uh, conservation presentation. I'm very interested in aquatic ecology um, and specifically, uh, you know, invasive species dynamics. Um, awesome. Thanks, Mitchell. Anyone else care to share? How about I see Trent? Yeah, go for it, Trent. Yeah, hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, I'm a grad student at the University of Arizona. Um, getting a master's in a degree called Water Society and Policy. So out west, really interested here in um, sharing river water resources across users and all the demands for water. Yeah, super hot topic right now. Thanks, Trent. And then I also see Felicia uh, put into the chat. Hi there, my name is Felicia Mills and I'm a student at NAU studying environmental studies with a GIS minor. I'd love to work with the Colorado River. Awesome, well, thank you all for, for sharing. And um, I think now we're gonna split into some breakout rooms. One group is going to just magically disappear when I hit the button, and one group is actually going to stay here um, with me. And then after about 15 minutes, we're going to just switch the groups. We're going to flip-flop. That way, everyone has a chance to, to discuss things with the presenters, but in a little bit smaller of a group. And then after that, I'll just bring you all back here. So it shouldn't really take a whole lot on your end. And um, going to go ahead and send you off now. I think we're just waiting. Coulter's going to disappear here. And then I think this is 
might be us. Hold on, we've got one more going. Oops. All right. I think this is us. All right. So, um, cool. I just wanted to first off, like, open it up, like, Peyton and Mitchell, if you have any questions or um, if you don't, we've got some questions that I can ask, but I just want to give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have off the bat. Um, yeah, uh, Kelly, I was hoping to hear a little bit more about your work um, and kind of your your path into how you um, became sort of, I, I, I think I'm remembering and getting, getting this right, a research scientist within the Forest <laughs> Service. Um, that's not a position. I've talked to a few people in the Forest Service, and that's not a position that I've heard a lot about. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, so um, maybe thinking kind of about where these positions in the Forest Service kind of lie. I know it's not um, it's not one, as you mentioned, that many people realize kind of even exists within the Forest Service. So um, the Forest Service has a management branch and it also has a research branch. And so I'm in that research branch. Um, and so those of us in, in my position, my type of position as a research ecologist, um, typically have a PhD and we're doing research, um, ideally at very broad levels to help inform management uh, for um, the Forest Service Management Branch. Um, my, as I mentioned earlier, my position is a little bit unique in that my research group doesn't just serve the Forest Service. We work with all agencies that administer wilderness. And so we're a little bit broader than the typical Forest Service research positions. But um, yeah, my, as I mentioned, my background's in aquatic ecology, but we also have um, in, in Forest Service research, there's all types of ecologists, biologists, social scientists, um, from soils to air, entomologists, fisheries folks, plant folks. So it's, it's actually really pretty broad. Um, but yeah, and then sort of how did I get to where I'm at? Um, I kind of had a, a, maybe a non-traditional route to getting to this type of job. A lot of um, people will um, take a very academic route in the sense that they'll get their PhD and they'll do like a traditional postdoc type of position. I didn't do that. Um, what I did is I worked in a more soft funded, a non-permanent position um, at, in, within Forest Service research um, for about seven years. And then it was just almost exactly a year ago that I started in this permanent position with the Forest Service. But the types of things that make you competitive for these types of positions are um, just being really involved in research. And so it is kind of really aligned with some of the academic um, type of approaches, as I mentioned, like doing a post postdoc um, position, um, working on publications, and so building kind of a publication record, um, and getting familiar with just forming really broad research questions that are also going to be helpful for management. Um, and so under working with managers on the ground, understanding their needs. And so I think that especially now, like in our current day in society, there's a really big shift towards like research need researchers and scientists needing to be able to communicate well with other people to um, communicate their science beyond just a publication, right? Like publications are, can be really dry. And like, so being able to help people understand your science and then connect with managers to understand their information needs. Thank you. So do you work with data from a specific, well, I guess you said your questions are quite broad. So I'm guessing you work with data from a wide range of um, wild and scenic rivers or, you know, forest service water bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, I can give you an example of some of the projects that I've been working on. One of the tools that I use um, very frequently is called environmental DNA. And so environmental DNA is just DNA that's left behind in the environment. And um, so it's kind of like forensics, right? Like we could swab somebody's glass and be like, oh, this person was at the scene of the crime. But in this case, we're actually looking for a particular species. And so 
we collect water samples and kind of strain or filter out the DNA. And then we can query that DNA in the lab and see if a particular species of interest is present. And so it's super easy to collect those samples. It only takes one person. It takes about 15 minutes. It's really efficient. So we can collect samples across broad spatial scales and get a really good idea of where species are on a really broad range. And so I've been working using environmental DNA to map distributions of Pacific lamprey across the Pacific Northwest. Um, that's a species that's really culturally important to a lot of Native American tribes in the area and has seen a lot of declines, but because it's not um, like a commercial, commercially sort of uh, desired species like salmon, we just don't know that much about it. And so that's an example of the type of um, type of project I've been working on um, as far as like different water bodies kind of all over the place. And, you know, the, the thing about rivers is they cross boundaries all the time. So there are times where I'm working with data that's not on um, public land or not necessarily in wilderness, but rivers connect everything, right? And so I think that's a really important um, kind of concept to hold onto when you're working in river systems. <laughs> mm -hmm. about that so that's really cool to hear mm -hmm. um i'm curious from like either you uh, or from both you kelly and danielle you know mm -hmm. just what are like what are kind of the hot topics that you're that you might be working on right now or um like like an area where like if you could have help right now to help you on a project what what might that be Danielle, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, so the the students in my lab and the research that I do really centers on a few topics that are oftentimes intersecting. Um, we do a lot of spatial analysis, looking at, uh, for instance, James's project was investigating uh, um, gaps in protected areas in the Southwest region that we're in um, to try to inform conservation decision-making on how to expand conservation in the area. And then another project that was going on simultaneously in, in the lab um, in James's cohort was um, prioritizing dam sites for removal and then subsequent restoration and protection of those newly restored sections of river. And both of those projects are um, projects that are downscale projects of larger pro national projects that we have proposed. So I need students in the lab who wanna do work like that. I also need students in the lab who wanna do work related to thinking about various types of protection policies that can be used for um, to help indigenous communities uh, protect and restore their river systems. Um, in oftentimes indigenous communities are you know within a, a Western governance framework, for example. And so how can we use, already existing policies like the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in what we call anti-colonial ways to protect rivers that are important and, and rivering ecosystem services that are important to those societies. And that work has, is going on here in the United States and also in other countries around the world. Um, so there's a lot of social science uh, methods that take place in the lab. So interviewing people, surveying people, participant observation, uh, and then a lot of spatial analysis and um, quantitative data analysis that we do here in the lab. It's a mix of both. Um, Peyton, I recognize you from the James River. Yeah, from the Footprints on the James and the Riverfield Studies Network summer we had in May. So it's really nice to see you here. Um, if you finish up at VCU and you want to join my lab, please send me your letter of interest. I'd love to have you over here doing continuing this work. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see what else. I think that's good for now. Let me know if there's anything else that you want to know. Uh, 
Um, I think things that I like I could use help with right now. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit more broadly because Danielle has a pretty um, established research program. I've been in my position for just a year, so I'm kind of getting up and going, but, you know, opportunities for grad students um, and things that I think are going to be really hot topics now are really going to be focused on things like climate change. Um, I think some of the, many of the things that Danielle mentioned, so thinking about how um, how we engage with indigenous peoples, how we engage with indigenous groups and incorporate um, broader knowledge systems into our decision-making process is gonna be really important. Um, it's something that I've been really happy to see being pushed kind of from a federal side of things here in the Forest Service getting um, kind of support for that type of work. So I think, yeah, engaging with those groups is going to be really important in the future of natural resource management. Um, and so it, it's great too to hear, Danielle, that your lab has such a strong focus on that. Um, yeah, but climate change, man, that's going to be a hot topic for a long time, but understanding understanding what are our expectations for change, right? Like we're kind of beyond a point of no return. We're not going to be able to keep ecosystems, um, keep um, ecological communities at some, you know, reference point from the past. We have to start thinking about how are we going to deal with and accept changes in our ecosystems moving into the future because that change is here and, and we know it's going to continue. So um, that's kind of something that um, those of us here at the Aldo Leopold Research Institute have been thinking a lot about in, in terms of wilderness. So I think that's another area to really think about a lot as you're navigating next steps and opportunities. Yes, I didn't mention, I'm glad you said climate change explicitly. Uh, we do a lot of work thinking about what rivers are going to be resilient mm -hmm. in the face of climate change and how yeah. can we assess potential resilience of rivers and then use those data, those results to inform conservation. So everything that I we do in the lab is very applied. It's, it's research that is driven from an advocacy perspective. Like we want to make sure that our research is actually making a difference in decision-making, whether it's by advocacy groups or by governments. And, and so it, it comes from an advocacy question, turns into scientific research questions, and then comes back out in the form of manuscripts that get published as in academic journal articles, but also in the form of white papers, story maps, um, other types of ways to disseminate that scientific research in ways that someone who doesn't want to read dense academic <laughs> journal articles can digest quickly and get the main points and use that to inform how they're making decisions over conservation um, policies, essentially. Kelly, you and I should work together. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Um, yeah, we should find a time to chat. Um, and I, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting is when you think about resilience, it's like, what? How do you define that, right? And and for who are you defining it? Are you defining it for a particular species, for a whole ecosystem? Are you looking at just like the hydro geomorphology perspective? You know, one thing that I think also is important to remember into the future is we're in conservation and science in general, we're beyond this point of um, being an expert in everything. Like you need to be able to communi communicate well, and work well, collaborate with people um, in order to get things done. Because I think, you know, like I'm coming at questions from a very um, sort of fish centric side of things. And, but in order for me to think about what are we protecting on a broad scale, it's like, I need to be able to work with and understand um, folks who are coming at it from like, like the hydrology side of things. And so, um, you know, you, knowing, knowing your stuff and knowing how to communicate your stuff across um, people with different subject backgrounds too is really important. So yeah, like I think, you know, thinking about next steps, it's like, um, think about the skills that you have, the skills you want to learn and um, kind of the big picture stuff is going to be really important. Um, I don't think it's going to be super uh, 
productive to just decide like, I only want to study this particular species, or I only want to study this particular river system. Like you're going to be really limiting yourself in opportunity and also really limiting your skill sets. I know we're a little low on time. So Andy, if you put us to cut me off. <laughs> to say that I think we're going to switch rooms, but if you have a question, write it down totally. Uh, we can come back to it <laughs> as well. Um, so, and then yeah. I'm also going to share contact information at the end so we can all, you can always follow up individually or directly if you'd like. So I'm going to go ahead and start switching Mitchell, you and Peyton into the other room. And we'll all be back here in about 15 minutes. Hi, Max and Trent. Apologies if I cut you all off during some great discussion. <laughs> um, oh, good. Um, perfect. Well, yeah, uh, I was, I've got some questions that I could ask to help guide discussion, but I just wanted to give you both uh, the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have off the bat to best use this time to your needs. I guess I'll kind of pick up where we ended in the last group. Um, I was just asking them, there are people with different expertise and specific topics they work on and stuff, um, but if there's any like coursework or skills or topics that you think are really applicable across all river work, they touched a lot on communication, writing and speaking. Um, so is there anything else besides those that come to mind for any of you? I would say GIS skills are pretty fundamental to all research related to rivers. Um, and uh, students having an understanding of the water policies that influence how our rivers get managed, how they get protected. Um, how they get developed, that, that's really important. So uh, like some sort of water resource policy management course is really important. And, and our, our river studies and leadership certificate students are required to take a policy class for that purpose. Um, students in my lab get a really deep dive into the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act because that's a policy that we work a lot with. Um, and then uh, some sort of aquatic ecology course, if that's if you're, if that's your thing, the natural science end of it. Danielle, I think for me, I think one of the most important classes I took was the fluvial geomorphology class mm. for the understanding of, of the river system itself um, and why these different policies are important and, and how they interact with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a, um, no matter what angle you're approaching kind of streams and rivers from having an understanding from the spectrum of both the geomorphology to some of the ecology type, like the foundational concepts there, sort of like the, um, you can go back to some of, there are a lot of papers from like the 70s and 80s that are kind of like the foundations of stream ecology. And I think those are really good to, um, to take a dive into, um, yeah, but just understanding how, how do rivers work? I think it's the more, it seems really simple, but when I think about it a lot, it's like, they're really mind blowing how dynamic they are, um, and how, um, that sort of stochastic nature of rivers is just the norm, right? Like they exist within this realm of constant change, um, 
I would also, this came up in our, with our previous group too, climate change is, is a hot topic. Um, so thinking about what does climate change mean practically for rivers in different systems and how does that affect their hydrology, right? Like um, in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, we're a lot more snow driven. And so if we don't get as much snow, when are we getting precipitation during different times of year? How does that change our typical plat patterns of flooding? In the Southwest, that's, that's it's probably going to be really different, right? It's not a snowpack driven system. It's more of a monsoonal driven system. What does that mean for those rivers as far as um, climate resilience and expectations for change um, in those systems? But I, uh, by and large, G having an understanding of GIS, geographic information systems, and being able to navigate some of that software, huge, <laughs> so huge. Yeah, I'm, I use Arc uh, Pro every day, mm -hmm. all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not just a basic GIS course, but actually learning how to program. So some, name some of the classes, James, or some of the skill sets that you've developed over the years beyond just ARC. I, I learned a lot more about GIS, not taking GIS classes. I learned a lot of it mm -hmm. through um, that food lead geomorphology class I took at Oregon. Um, allowed me to, to latch onto a field crew in the summer. And so I spent you know, a summer in Eastern Oregon throwing rocks down a river after measuring them uh, you know, and, and doing other you know, things that were awesome and a lot of cool and spent time. But then uh, I was curious about it and curious about the GIS system and the equipment that we use. And we used a lot of um, um, like GPS technology out in the field. And I had taken a GIS class, but when we get back to the lab, they let me get to dive into that. And I learned through trial and error over the next three or four years or three years at Oregon, um, working in the lab in the wintertime and in the field in the summertime, uh, but developing GIS skills. And lab, like I've always told people that I'm, I have a degree in GIS, but really what that means is that I'm really, really good at Google. And because like all those questions are out there on some sort of like stack overflow, um, and there's always going to be like something new. And I do refer back to RTIS books and stuff like that. Uh, but most of the time you can find what you need online and you can find people with a similar problem. Um, I would say another thing that's really important uh, is learning some rudimentary coding skills. Uh, so I took Python as an undergrad and I like that because it, it ties directly into the program. Uh, but I also worked on R uh, while in grad school and I love R because you can make it do the same stuff uh, but, but you can do it from outside the, the, the uh, ArcGIS platform and not even ever go into ArcGIS and manipulate spatial data that way which is really cool so something fun to or you know important to learn a little bit about um, and having those books as resources are good too and the time spent um, working with especially in grad school we had groups that we you know we were all in the same class and we all be stumped by the same lab stuff in R and we work for it together for hours and be able to noodle it through and it, it helps like being able to work with other people and work with problems and with learning like basic like coding skills for for GIS. Max can you remind us what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. And first, Danielle, I just want to um, thank Trent for repeating that question. The, the responses in this discussion are, are um, complementary, but also quite different um, from those that, that were given in, in the last group. Um, my, my current role is, is managing emerging projects within food system dynamics in, in the hunger relief system, actually. Um, and I'm in Pacific Northwest in, in Bellingham, Washington, which has experienced some, some pretty major flooding in the last year and likely to experience more uh, every year with, um, with climate change. And the, the angle that, that I'm approaching this discussion and this learning session from, I guess, is both as an as a, um, employee in the in nonprofit social service sector, which is a little bit less oriented around the hard sciences, uh, but also being interested in the possible transition of career into work specifically around natural resource management. So one of the, the primary questions that I guess I have um, relevant to what we've just been talking about 
um, is uh, having having heard very distinctly the the need for for grounding in some of these hard skills and hard scientific concepts. Um, if there are career paths that either you any of you have followed or that you have seen colleagues follow that have that foundational grounding in in that hard sciences, the mapping, uh, the GIS coding realms, but but also uh, trend more toward the human human use patterns. Uh, and if if it's possible to separate those two at all, or if basically everyone that works in any context of public lands and natural resource management really needs to start at that foundational level of, of coding. Uh, that's that's I guess my question for you. That's a great question. And I in the last room I mentioned that in our lab we do a lot of that traditional natural science stuff and GIS work, but we're also using a lot of social science methods. So surveying people, interviewing people, understanding what their perceptions of risk are, what their perceptions of protections are, and then taking that social science data and using that to inform policy questions. So it, that seems to be a little more in line with what you're working on with the, 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 the human community interface. And, and as I mentioned in the last room, the, um, we do research in this lab that's ultimately driven by advocacy and conservation questions that we then turn into research questions scientific research questions, and then the results of our studies are used to inform decision-making. They're used by nonprofits. They're used by federal agencies. They're used by governments internationally and nationally to make decisions about how to restore a river, how, where to restore, where to put our efforts into conservation or protection and restoration where to say, hey, that's a no-go zone, you know, maybe you should move people out of that area because it's going to become more readily vulnerable to flooding in the case of what you're looking at. So, um, so absolutely, if that's your interest, there's certainly a way for you to stay in that social science realm and still transition into working for a nonprofit or a federal agency. For example, in James's cohort, there was a student who did research, um, social science research interviews and surveys on people's perceptions of wild and scenic rivers protection, um, pro uh, proposed protection of the Gila River in New Mexico. And that research landed her a job with the Forest Service in New Mexico um, as the, I don't know the exact title because she's changed positions now, but essentially she's like the special use permit um, coordinator for one of the national forests and manages the wild and scenic rivers uh, program on a couple of rivers. And so that's very social science oriented. She took GIS and she took some of those natural science classes, but really it's her social science skills that are informing her, her career. At this and, point. and I would say that her using it in her actual work has improved her skills immensely. Like, so she just pulled through the GIS, uh, asked me a ton of questions. We sat at the desk next to each other. Um, but now uh, she pretty much figures everything out on her own. She'll come to me every once in a while. I'll get a FaceTime call or something GIS related. But she's become over the last two years much more proficient just by working with GIS. She doesn't know how to code a thing, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for for what it's worth, I don't do any coding in GIS. I, the coding I do is in R, and it's more of a statistic, like for statistical analyses. But um, it is something that's important to have a, an understanding of when you're in kind of some of some of the harder sciences um, doing that kind of analysis. But like, do you need to be an expert in it? No, like you don't need to go out there and, and get a GIS certificate and know all of the different softwares and programs, but to have an understanding um, is great. And then, you know, like James pointed out, Google is a really good friend when it comes to that. And it, it um, it's kind of just getting over the hurdle of like, what is the question I need to ask to get you know, what do I need to actually Google search to get to where the answer that I need? Um, and once you kind of figure that out, get past that learning curve, it, it kind of comes together. 
and there's always people too who are willing to help like it's something that is so commonly used that um you kind of learn as you go and um ask questions of people and and get what you need done it's, it's fun to see people's aha moment when they figure mm -hmm. something out thank you all so much appreciate that perspective mm -hmm. um take a moment to let you know that our breakout times have uh, ended. Everyone's going to be just joining back into this room. So in about 30 seconds or so, um, that was some great discussion. All right. All right, I think, there we go. I think we've got everyone back. I apologize if I interrupted any great discussions that were going on, but um, really hoping that today just serves as like a starting point to have these conversations and I really want to encourage everyone to, you know, if you have any questions with any of today's panelists to, to follow up, I'm going to put a link um, in the chat here to a handout that has everyone's emails on it from that Google Drive link. You should just be able to download the PDF. I can also attach the PDF here in the file. Um, but I just wanted to you know, kind of take a moment and and see if there were any follow up questions. And the way we were going to do this is maybe um, through this Jamboard activity. So I'm going to put another link in the chat to open up this Jamboard. And this, like, I totally understand that it's uh, very fresh. You might still be processing some of what you heard. But just wanted to take a moment in case um, and give you the opportunity to reflect a little and think of any questions. So once you click that link on your screen in the chat, it'll open this up on your screen. Um, and here we've got hot takes. So like, what are your hot take? What's your hot take on some of today's conversation? What insight did you form? And then over here on the right, we've got cool questions. What, uh, what questions do you have that others might not think to ask or any lingering questions you might have? And to post a question, you can come over here to the left side, go to sticky note. You can type in, um, you know, whatever your follow-up question is. I can't think of one off the top of my head and then hit save. Then you can move it over to the area that you would like. If you'd like, you can attach your name. You don't have to. And again, that's that second link. Or I also, you know, want to take advantage of the opportunity of everyone being here. If there's any last burning questions, if any of you want to just come off mute and go ahead and ask one right now. Um, Maybe raise your hand. Oh, I like the what dream or what career do you dream of having? Anyone want to answer that? That's open to everyone. <laughs> I really like my position right now. I don't really feel like leaving it. But um, in recent years, I've found myself behind the desk more often. And uh, I kind of, let's just say I feel nostalgic for my time in the field. Yeah. I can, I, uh, I can uh, sympathize with that. Absolutely. I started out as a river guide and um, and spent a lot of time on, on the water. And now I just spend a lot of time thinking about the water. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's still good. It's still good, but, uh, 
being in Flagstaff, we don't actually have any rivers here to easily get on, so it just makes it a little difficult. <laughs> yeah, I echo that too. It's um, you know, kind of like the early days in your career when you're really getting out in the field all the time. It's great, and then as you kind of um, assume positions with more responsibility, you get um, caught inside a little bit more. Uh, but at the same time, there are some trade offs like, you know, I'm kind of at a point in life now where um, it's kind of nice to have a little bit more of a predictable schedule. Like I know I'm going to be in the office. So kind of the rest of my life is not so crazy if I'm in the field all the time. So it's kind of a balance, you know, it's, um, it's a give and take and um, yeah, but field time is is always the most fun. So take advantage of those opportunities. And they're also great learning opportunities, even as you continue to settle into a job where you may be behind the desk, don't underestimate the value of getting out there and seeing those field sites. It puts a lot of things in perspective. I might just jump in if it, if it won't offend anyone. The navigating the, the jam board wasn't working on that well for me. Um, curious if, if any of you had um, Suggestions, pretty open-ended question, but the things that first inspired you to get involved in this work, particularly written resources, are there, were there, were there books that got you really inspired either about the hard science topics or just about uh, time on rivers? Were there individual experiences that felt to you like they were pivotal in, in your transition into this work? Um, what, what got you so inspired to be, to be uh, in the position that you're in now? Well, I would say that inspiration in, in my case and in a lot of the cases of people that I know doesn't come from books. Um, a lot of people that I know, myself included, I went on my first river trip and I fell in love. And there's no book that you can read that in. So um, I think to work in this profession, you have to have a visceral love and it has to be very personal. So um, the book learning is really secondary. The book learning is what sort of prepares you to ask difficult questions, engage in public processes, understand relationships, work well with partners. Those are the pieces that I think you can learn. But um, I'm not sure that you, you stay in this profession working in rivers if you don't love them um, in a very personal way. I would add that sometimes the book learning comes after the experience. So like for me, um, one of the most interesting things, one thing that I point back to was uh, I, I lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia on the Rappahannock River uh, and they blew up the dam and it was like right outside my house. So the Embry Dam was taken out in the early 2000s and we had a party on my front yard and watched it get blown up at like seven o'clock in the morning. And then I wanted to know more about that. And at that time I was bartending uh, downtown and it was just something I didn't know much about, but uh, I learned a lot about later and how it, you know, create connectivity for the eels and for the other androgynous fish and things like that. Um, Gadrous fish, the so fish that go between the river and the, and the ocean for spawning purposes and how that opened up hundreds of miles of, of tributaries that have been blocked off for over a hundred years. Uh, so those are the things you come back and then you learn more uh, about later. And then you think back to that and you're like, that was really cool. And that's a really cool thing that I saw. Coulter, I see your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just I wanted to share a perspective that is around values. So just want to encourage people who are thinking about or starting their career to think about where their personal values within themselves lie, where, where they originate from and how they relate to river stewardship. And then and then seeking organizations that have similarly aligned values. I believe that that will help ensure you have a satisfying career. Um, if your personal values, what motivates you, what drives you, what gets you through hard times, what inspires you um, is aligned with where you're working, um, you are likely to have a fulfilling experience. And, and I provided a comment in the chat about, I know I make a difference in the work I do. Um, and it has to do with my personal values on where I want to be and where I want my the calories that I spend in the day I, uh, that I spend around river stewardship, I know that makes a difference and, and it has to do with who I work with, both the people and the organization. So please think about that. Yeah, one, one piece of advice for like, how do I get into this? You're gonna have to want to. Um, 
and it it helps you know you you're finally sitting in front of an interview panel and if you can honestly look at the panel in the face and say you're not going to see anyone who cares more about this than I do if you can tell them that truthfully you're going to make a good impression um because you can't do this work the attrition rate is really really high and you won't be able to do this work if you don't care about it so a river that's important to you not just any river it's not a like finance where you can just go be an accountant at another firm right be have passion yeah and i would add to that i have students ask me all the time you know how what should i do what career should i have and what kind of jobs can i get with these degrees and the best advice that I can give a student and always give a student is do what you love. Because if you're doing what you love, then it's going to shine through, as Tony mentioned in the interview, but you're going to do good in all your classes. You're going to, even if it's not a class you're interested in, you're doing, you're on the trajectory of what you love and you know that somehow that's going to inform you, your work either now or later. And you're going to do a good job at all of what you do. And so you're going to stand out. You're going to go the distance. You're going to do all the extra things that you have to do to get that job. And if you're not doing what you love, like being an accountant, you're not going to want to do all those extra things, right? You're going to just do what you need to do to get that degree. Um, and, you know, I also am a non was a non-traditional student. I had no idea what I wanted to study in college. I had taken a bunch of AP classes in high school. I got out of high school and wanted nothing to do with school for a while. And I knew, had always wanted to be a river guide as a kid. And I'd been rafting every summer and wanted to do that. So I did it. And it was my job as a river guide that actually exposed me to a lot of the challenges that our rivers are facing, the, the damming, the diversions, the pollution, the invasive species, the, the loss of native species. Um, and I did that career internationally and got involved with advocacy work internationally. And that's what inspired me to go back to school because I finally found the way to merge the thing that I love with an education track. And I went back and studied all the degrees, you know, to get to where I am now. And so I get to still be an advocate, but I also get to be a scholar. Um, and, and, and so that's where, where, how I ended up here. Um, and you all have your own path, um, but doing what you love is fundamental um, to getting where you wanna be. Yeah, Tanji, go ahead if you want to um, say some last comments and then I want to do a quick touch on the symposium and then we're done, uh, but go for it, Tanji. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize again that we hope that this session was a start to a conversation. Of course, you can speak to every single person in the scope of one hour, but I think you would genuinely enjoy spending an entire hour with each one of these people learning about their careers and the things that they're passionate about in their work. Um, so yeah, I just encourage you to use the resource that Angie has shared in the chat with contact info and hope that um, that ideas were sparked or questions were, were sparked as well. So back to you, Angie. Thanks, Angie. That was exactly what I was going to say. Um, and then last, I just uh, want to have James share a little bit about his perspective as a student. Um, I just want to let you all know coming up, we've got our river management symposium. It's going to be in San Antonio, Texas next February. And there's lots of uh, really great networking and just all sorts of opportunities, especially for students. But I've not been there as a student myself. James has, so I'll let him speak real quickly to that. Yeah, I'm really excited about the upcoming symposium in San Antonio. This will be my third symposium, RMS symposium. And the first one was in uh, Washington, so just north of Portland. Um, and it was awesome. We we were, I just started grad school. I was drinking from a fire hose. I didn't know exactly what I was doing yet. I didn't know what my project was exactly yet. But I came up, you know, I, I went up there uh, with other grad students in my cohort. Uh, we drove all the way from Flagstaff to Washington, um, gave a presentation 
about something I completely changed it completely something completely different. Um, but it was really a great opportunity to really see some of the river management folks for the first time, two people that are involved in the agencies and working with rivers. And even though I didn't get to know them very well at that time, I've seen them over and over again over the years. And I was able to put a, a face and a name back to the time that I'd seen them at a conference so long ago. And now that, you know, maybe my name pops up and maybe they don't remember it, but I can be like, well, I saw you here and have a point of conversation, a uh, point of contact to initiate more conversation and get to know the community better. And then, and it really is, you'll really, if you get involved with like the river and even across like federal agencies and advocacy groups, uh, nonprofits, you'll see a lot of the same folks. You'll see a lot of the same names and a lot of the same uh, people. So it's, it's really, there's a really is a river community um, of people working out here. And I think it's, it's cool that y'all are interested in joining. And uh, I think it'd be really, I think it's beneficial to go uh, to, the, to, the, to the symposium. It was for me, um, it helped me. Uh, any symposium you can go to and talk, I'm not the world's greatest public speaker, but every um, opportunity to practice and get better is a, is a really great uh, thing to do. So I encourage you to not only come to the um, symposium, but before the 30th, if you'd like, you could sign up to present at the symposium and share some of your research as well. Thank you so much, James. And um, thank you to everyone for joining us. I know we've got a couple minutes over and I want to be respectful about your time. So um, just want to let you know one last thing is when you end the Zoom meeting today, a little survey is going to pop up in a window. We'd really appreciate any feedback that you have for us. Um, or you're always welcome to shoot me an email and, and just let us know what's valuable to you. Because um, really, we're just trying to, you know, help prepare the next generation of, of river stewards and, and managers and protectors and all of that. So thank you again to all of today's panelists for your time. Thank you for everyone for joining us and uh, stay in touch. And uh, I'll be sending out the recording soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.